So this is week five of our pick and uh, visionary creativity. And we're going to talk about Marshall McLuhan, media technology and extensions. And now let me get out of this lecture and I'm going to play just a minute of McLuhan. And the reason I want to do that is <clears throat> hearing his voice, you can sort of put this in the context. And um, maybe it sounds a little stuffy to us today, but it... Uh, blew everybody away at the time. So let's go to, now there's about a, a dozen McLuhan interviews on YouTube. This is a long one, it's in three parts, but we'll just listen to a minute of it. And this is the host. And music industries. Earlier tonight, Professor McLuhan gave his address, and now he is ready for questions from the audience with us, made up of the participants in the seminar and members of the general public. Well, Professor McLuhan, uh, I think we'd better deal with uh, the medium as the message before it does go to the 21st century. Uh, when you say the, the medium is the message, does that leave any room at all for criticism of individual, say, television programs or content? Okay, so the, when McLuhan comes on the scene, it's a time of what was then called a generation gap. How many people here feel estranged from your parents, like they're another generation? Not too many, a couple. But it was very common then, and McLuhan suggests it's because in 1970, say 12 plus when this is happening, uh, one's parents were literate. They read books. The young people at this time had grown up watching TV. Their brains were wired totally different. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the media, re, each media, each medium wires us up in a different way. The parent generation went berserk about McLuhan's idea. My father is very literate. And boy, did he not like McLuhan. And we had big arguments. And it's totally typical of what you're hearing here. With the parent generation saying, well, isn't content important? Isn't content what's important? McLuhan says, no, you're not getting what I'm saying. It doesn't matter what the content is. Uh, it's what it's doing to your brain. So that's what the host is getting at here. He's going to keep hammering that because he can't buy McLuhan's point. The young people are going, yeah! Um, yes. <clears throat> you see, it doesn't much matter what you say on the telephone. The telephone as a service is a huge environment. And that is the medium. And the environment affects everybody. What you say on the telephone affects very few. And the same with radio or any other medium. What you print is nothing compared to the effect of the printed word. The printed word sets up a paradigm, a structure of awareness, which affects everybody in very, very drastic ways. And it doesn't very much matter what you print as long as you go on with that form of activity. You've said that uh, television promotes illiteracy. I'm wondering whether you think it's a bad thing. Uh, I don't think it promotes illiteracy. I think it creates another form of awareness. Uh, literacy had uh, very strange antecedents, very strange effects on people, and uh, we're only beginning to notice what those effects were now, but it tends to be pushed aside. Uh, the uh, literacy uh, as a form of awareness is a highly specialist and objective sort of thing. You can stand back, the literate man can stand back objectively and look at situations. The TV person has no objectivity at all. <laughs> so we're talking about immersion in these different media, totally changing everything. What's, what would McLuhan be talking about today? What are we immersed in that everybody's starting to really worry about? Social media. Social media, right. What does it mean that would it also be like on mobile devices? Like on well, devices? through which you access social media. Yeah. In other words, if you're accessing Wikipedia on that thing, 
it's probably not going to, you know, it saves a trip to the library. But in social media, it's totally making a new creature out of us. And <clears throat> from how we exist in, as perceived by our friends, if it's Facebook, uh, and what Facebook is doing with our data. <laughs> Everybody's starting to worry about that. Uh, so, um, we miss McLuhan. <laughs> and there are people trying to... Uh, so there's a magazine that addresses all this called Wired Magazine. And one of the first issues, one of the early issues of Wired Magazine, uh, a writer channeled McLuhan to talk about the um, computer. But it was still early in the, in the history of the internet, and it was before social media. Now, it's not really true because AOL was social media, and it was one of the first things on the internet. They just didn't figure out how to do it the way Facebook did. But... Uh, it's also different because it's using images, though. Well, an image is a whole other thing. Now, are we in 10 years, are we all going to be using hieroglyphs with emoji? In other words, the... the ex and if you look at BuzzFeed and Vice, it was probably mostly text in the beginning. Now it's mostly videos. So... Uh, I mean, you can watch a BuzzFeed 15-minute video. Can you read an article for 15 minutes? <laughs> Something that takes 15 minutes to read? Oh, now, <clears throat> I would... Um, okay, I'll tell the whole story. My late wife used to teach here. She had a class over in the basement of the library. So, and it would be Friday evening, and after class, we'd go out and get dinner and go to a bookstore. But uh, I'd, go, I'd finish class, I'd go over there, and i have, say, an hour to kill while she's finishing her class. So I would dig out a 1960s, we have lots of magazines in the library. So Esquire was a very literate magazine um, in the 60s. So I'd go get a bound volume, say, 1960. Six, uh, Esquire's, and I flipped to it. It'd be an article by Norman Mailer. 20 pages. No pictures. Just solid type for 20 pages. I mean, you'll never see that in a magazine today. You'll break it up with headlines and graphics. No one can look at 20 pages of solid type. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, maybe we're moving to visual images, <laughs> you know, away from, uh, away from type. I'll tell you, I cover, now, I spend $600 a month for mini storage for my books. And that's after giving 3,000 of them to the Pratt Library and taking boxes of them to a strand to sell. I'm trying to think, okay, in the past five years, it may be zero, but certainly I've read cover to cover less than five books. I've listened to maybe 500 <laughs> on audiobooks. So this is a total change. And I'm very aware of audiobooks, same book, being very different from reading. If I read a book, the books that I read in school that I can, if I'm looking for something, I know it's about two-thirds of the way through the book on the upper right-hand part of the page. I don't remember the page number or anything, but I have a feeling for where it is. If it's something I heard on an audio book, it's like maybe I'll have a vague memory of where I was when I heard it, but that doesn't help me find what, what book was that, what was that. You know, it, it, I think I'm getting a lot out of it but not the way I did when I was reading. So these things totally change us. So let's see what McLuhan has to say about this. Now the point of this is gonna be 
how can we use this to understand the world we are in today that we will be creating in? And my suggestion is that the people who are going to be successful creators are those who are going to understand our world in these terms. So, uh, McLuhan wrote several books, and now I need to get a laser pointer. Actually, there's a laser pointer built in here. Let's see if I can find it. I have to figure out how to... Well, let's see. Can we use the... Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, he wrote a book called The Guttenberg... Well, his first book was called The Mechanical Bride. And it was mostly about advertising. And I... It was not a big success. Uh, then he wrote The Guttenberg the Galaxy. And... It's about... How did um, the world of type change? How did type change the world? And basically, he feels it brought us the Renaissance. In other words, reading brought about linear logical thought and point of view that we see in the Renaissance. And so we'll get back to that. But then, 1964, he releases Understanding Media, the Extensions of Man. <clears throat> and it exploded. Um, there's a major review of it in the New Yorker, which I, I guess I was getting the New Yorker at the time, and I was in college or in architecture school. And so I immediately got the book, and whoa! And just everybody I knew was talking about it. And McLuhan lectured in colleges. He came to our campus, and uh, as everybody's arguing about it, it totally... Uh, came into the culture. So, McLuhan shows how our technologies change, not only our external environment. So if you have automobiles, you know, it means there's going to be cars out there. Uh, there's going to be highways. But it also re rewires our brain. That is, the workings of our minds, or what I call structures of cognition or structures of consciousness. Um, the invention of the printing press brought about cheap books, gave the common person access to the Bible, etc. But it also led to many people reading. So what do you do when you read? You move your eye across a line of print that's made up of words that are made up of letters. Doing so exercises a different part of the brain than one exercised by listening to speech. So, before the printing press, people heard, you know, three cliched, gathered around the campfire to hear Homer recite the Iliad and the Odyssey. And now you're reading it in a book. Well, the your ear con next with your auditory nerves going to the auditory centers of the brain. And when you exercise something, it develops. If you don't use it, it atrophies. So the auditory part of the brain is more developed in oral people. And the linear logical part of the brain, which your optical center goes to, that you use in reading becomes developed in literate people. And it leads to totally different kinds of thinking, linear logical thinking. Doing so exercises a different part of the brain than the one that had been exercised by listening to speech. The brain was changed, leading to visually centered linear logical thinking, leading to perspective painting, humanism, and eventually the Industrial Revolution. <clears throat> so you say, okay, uh, text is made up of paragraphs, which is made up of words, which is made up of letters, and your eye proceeds, it accumulates the letters, turns it into a word, holds that, accumulates the rest of the words in the sentence, puts that into a meaning, 
holds that, finishes the paragraph, puts it all together. In a clockwork machine, this gear turns this gear, turns this gear, turns this gear, called industrialization. This kind of thinking led to that. Electronic communications, including the telegraph, telephone, etc., led to other changes in the working of the brain, and now computers, the internet, social media are yet again changing not only our external environment, but also the workings of our brains. So let's put this together. So, McLuhan writes, this is the opening of his book, after 3,000 years of explosion, by means of fragmentary and mechanical technologies, the Western world is imploding. During the mechanical age, we had extended our bodies in space. Today, after more than a century of electronic technology, we have extended our central nervous systems itself into a global embrace, abolishing both space and time as far as our planet is concerned. So imagine <clears throat> it's before the telegraph or before the transatlantic cable. Let's say it's the American Revolutionary War. And uh, the Americans are trying to get the French to ally with us against the British. So you send a message to France. It takes six weeks to get there. They send a message back. It takes six weeks to get back. Uh, they say, fine, we'll send troops. It takes six weeks for the troops to get here. You say, great, they got here. It takes six weeks for them to get the message. How they run a war, I don't know. <laughs> but now imagine you uh, transatlantic cable, you send a telegraph message. It's there in six seconds or less. Everything's changed. All of a sudden, New York to London is not six weeks there and six weeks back. It's six seconds there and six se It's instant. There's no distance. You can send a telegraph message to the person down on the third floor at the, just as quick as you can send one to, to London. So now space is totally changed. Distance is not what it used to be. If you're sending goods there, it's an issue. But if you're sending information, it's like instant. My uh, brother-in-law lives with us. He's addicted to the Los Angeles Times. We got a lot of newspapers. <laughs> Stop getting the Wall Street Journal, but we were getting the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, USA Today, and the Daily News. So he said, well, what about the LA Times? I said, every day or just Sunday? He says, Sunday, because they have a lot of movie. He's into movies. They have a lot of movie industry news and stuff like that. So I order it, and it comes. It's Xeroxed. <laughs> it's it's you know, laser printed. So they don't, you know, fly the LA Times to New York. They just send it by wire, and my delivery service prints it out and sends it over. Um, McLuhan writes, rapidly we approach the final phase of the extensions of man, a technological simulation of consciousness. What's the technology people are really maybe worried about? Uh, okay, the, yes, manipulating GN DNA, and what's the other one? AI. AI. The technological simulation of consciousness. He's writing about it in 1964. When the creative process of knowing will be collectively and corporately extended to the whole of human society, much as we have already extended our senses and our nerves by various media. What does that mean? What does it mean that, who writes Wikipedia? Everybody. It's the whole of human society all cooperating. And for some reason it works. <laughs> they didn't know it was gonna work. Uh, they tried to do it by having edit, you know, hiring editors to write it, and that, that didn't get anywhere. And the idea of letting just anybody write articles 
<laughs> it could have been, might not have worked, but it did. Marsh McLuhan writes, today, after more than half a century of electronic technology, more than a century of electronic technology, we have extended our nervous system itself in a global embrace, absorbing by space and time as far as the planet is concerned. Now, his book is subtitled The Extensions of Man. Okay? I'm going to change this. Now, get binoculars. That extends my vision. I hit something with my fist. Now I hit it with a hammer. That extends my leverage and hardness of my hand. So tools are extensions of our body. Now I read something. I've stored information here that I can't hold in my head. What happens when that extension isn't just on paper, but my wife happens to be in California right now. This is going through satellites, through fiber optic cables, through God knows how, let's be right. And my nervous system is now 90% outside of my head. <laughs> all of, all that stuff is now plugged in. Now, we're talking about when will you actually put a chip in there. I don't think that's a big issue because I think it's already happened. It goes right into your ear, right into your nervous system. Now, I have friends who, who don't, you know, who, who don't read or listen to books. So when, when can I get the, you know, the entire Library of Congress and a chip that they'll put in my brain? They're getting there. But um, here it is. What does this do? And we, we, described the 19th century as an age of anxiety. Well, yeah, you'd be anxious if 90% of your nervous system is outside of your skull. <laughs> Sprun all, strewn all over the place. <laughs> so, McLuhan is a genius for seeing it that way. He's the first person. And after his book came out for about 20 years, hundreds and hundreds of PhD theses were written just from one paragraph in his book. Now, let's build up to McLuhan, and we'll start with Immanuel Kant. Now, uh, one aspect of philosophy seeks to ask, what is reality? What is ultimately reality? And, We'll take a break around six. Um, well, you know, there's this table, and uh, it's hard, black, particle board, metal legs, a uh, certain size. And what we realize is that Does that tell us anything about the table? Let's go through it. It's black. Is it black? No, black is something in, in us. Let's say we're red. The, the red is not in the table. The red is in our perception. Just some wavelength coming from the table, maybe. And we know from optical illusions that we can make the red look orange or yellow or, you know, depending upon the other colors and surrounding it and stuff like that. So the color really comes from us. Well, it's hard. What does hard mean? It means it resists my knuckles. <laughs> so hard is something that comes from us. 
Uh, well, it's heavy. Well, what does heavy mean? It means I have a hard time lifting it. If I was much stronger, it wouldn't be heavy. <laughs> if I was much weaker, it'd be a lot heavier. So what is the table, the thing in itself, what independent of my experience of it, what can we say about the table? And Kant says, we can never know the thing in itself. What we know is our perception. But we notice that everything we perceive has space, dimension, time, causality. These are universals in everything we perceive in the world. Therefore, these are qualities, universal qualities of how we perceive of our brains. Now, this whole idea fell apart in the late 19th, early 20th century, because what happened was space and time changed. When he said space and time, he meant Newtonian space, which is uniform and continuous. You can put a grid through this whole room, through all of New York, through all of the universe. And anywhere in that grid, you know what time it is, is a universal clock. If it's 5.50 here, if we coordinate our watches, it's 5.50 on the moon, it's 5.50 on Mars. What Einstein's relativity shows us is that that's not true. That the space, space and time are different for different observers. There is no universal space and time. So then, what Hegel, Friedrich Hegel tells us, is that the importance of history, space and time are different in different cultures, are different at different times. Now, I'm not going to go through all this stuff down here. If you download this slide, these slides are on the LMS, you can download them. And if you want, you can even, once you have, they're all PowerPoints, you can grab this text and put it in uh, Word or whatever. Um, and it comes from Wikipedia. So things really change. Things are different in different times and different cultures. Now, how and why does it change? And Hegel says, this world is a reflection of spirit. Sometimes it says spirit, sometimes it says God. And God is evolving toward a higher nature. And as God evolves, the world evolves. So what we are capable of in our consciousness changes over time due to this evolution of spirit. Somebody found that a little fishy, Karl Marx. So Marx liked to, to say, I stand Hegel on his feet. In other words, God does not influence us, we influence God. God is the result of the consciousness of the people at a given time. And that consciousness is changed by the material means of production. So if you have a hunting gathering society, it's gonna have a shamanic religion, it's gonna have a certain kind of marriage, it's gonna have a certain kind of male-female relations, it's gonna be maybe reasonably egalitarian, if you have an agricultural society, you're going to have specialization. Some people are going to be farmers. Some people are going to be engineers building the irrigation. Some people are going to build the storage for the grain. Uh, some people are going to be the rulers. And um, 
the moment you get to agriculture, which is 4,000, no, it depended, four or 5,000 years ago on a large scale, you get specialization. And as soon as you have specialization, you have inequality. So you say, okay, the farmers are going to grow the grains, the engineers are going to make the irrigation, and then these people are going to keep the records. What do we call them today? Bankers. And they somehow get the biggest cut, even though they don't do anything. <laughs> so what's the reaction to that? You get teed off. So this leads to class struggle, and that class struggle leads to dynamic changes over history. So, fundamental is the material means of production. This leads to social structures that have inequalities, which lead to um, objections to those inequalities, which are the dynamics of the class struggle, which lead to the dynamics of historical change. So that's Marxism. Now, let's go back to Kant saying, we only know what we perceive. We never know what's the real table. I only know, you might perceive it differently. It's a red table and you're colorblind. Let's say colorblind is not a disease. It's just, say, you're red, green, colorblind, and I'm blue, purple, colorblind. Neither of us is wrong. We just see differently. So you say that the, the, the table is X, and the other person says the table is Y. How many people know the big internet story about that? So let's see what we find here. Tell us about it. Speak up so everyone can hear. Blue and black or white and gold. So we want Google. We want images. Oh, it didn't come up first. It didn't read our minds. It's way down here. What is what's what are the colors of this dress? Does anybody not see blue and black? What do you see? You see white and gold? What? You see blue and black. See? I mean, it's like, I what? <laughs> if I see, like, I saw both of them. I think you can shift it. I remember shifting. It's, it's well, here's like, one where it, it puts them. I've never been able to shift it, but I heard that's about um, the colors of your screen or something. No, but we have two people here seeing it different. But, like, we're sitting different. I don't think it matters. How many people see blue and black? How many see white and gold? There you go. <laughs> so, our perception <clears throat> I don't know what word to use, determines, dictates, influences the world we experience. And um, whether the dress is blue and black or white and gold depends upon how you're wired. Um, and the, now, People have very different experiences at very different different times 
in different cultures at different periods of history, McLuhan says it's because they have been rewired by different dominant media, print technology versus electronic technology, for example. Um, Maurice Merleau-Ponty uh, is a phenomenologist. So phenomenology is closely related to existentialism and was a prominent branch of philosophy, maybe influenced by <clears throat> Martin Heidegger, the, who is the most prominent existentialist? <laughs> 1940s through the 60s, 70s. John Paul Sartre. So he's the most famous existentialist. So existentialism and phenomenology are very closely related. In fact, Merleau Ponty was the political editor of Jean Paul Sartre's newspaper. So they're very related. And phenomenology says <clears throat> um, let's look at the phenomenon. Let's look at you're seeing hard, black, heavy table. I'm seeing a blue and black dress. Um, let, what, do you, what, what do you experience? What's going on? Merleau Ponty goes beyond and he says, the perceptive organ is not, okay, so your eyes are a perceptive organ, right? And we tend to think of them as the main perceptive organ. And then hearing would be second most important. So you probably want to, if you're going to lose senses. You probably want to keep your sight would be number one. Hearing would be number two. And, you know, it'd be unpleasant to lose your taste, but you'd rather keep your eyesight. So, but most of these things are going on in the brain anyway. There's a beautiful writer named Oliver Sacks. Anybody ever read anything by him? His most famous book and his, his short essays, <clears throat> The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. So Oliver Sacks is a, was, was a doctor who recently died. He was a neurologist. And he worked in a hospital and he had had people come in with, you know, like a brain lesion or brain injury. And this would cause phenomena like this guy couldn't tell, like you'd show him a glove and he couldn't see it as a whole thing. He could see it, but he didn't know it was a glove. He says, well, it seems to have five things, a slightly different size. Maybe it's the whole change. Pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters. Uh, you know, he couldn't. And then when he left the, se the session, he reached for his wife's head instead of his hat. He couldn't tell the difference. Some part of his brain was damaged. Well, one of his patients was a painter, had a very minor car accident, bumped his head. He couldn't see color. He saw in black and white. It damaged something in there. He only saw black and white. He said, food tasted horrible, but even worse was sex. It just wasn't, didn't work <laughs> in black and white. And eventually he adopted a whole style of painting that worked with the way he perceived and became again a successful artist. But, and <clears throat> Sachs was interested, what is the human experience of having one of these conditions? Um, and um, a really weird one is, uh, one of his last books is about music. His last book was about hallucinations. The one before that was about music. And he described someone who got a, was a klutz at music, got a brain injury, who was immediately a brilliant pianist. Just, just like that. Um, but Melo Ponty says, it's not just the eyes and ears. It's the perceptive organ. It's your entire body. 
and he coins the term body subject. What makes this a chair? Pardon? We choose for it to be a chair. Say it say louder. We choose for it to be a chair. We sit in it. Or we can say we make it a chair by the fact that we sit in it. In other words, to be a little gross, what makes it a chair is my butt. <laughs> now you can you can try, oh, it's got four legs, or it has a seat in the back, or you put this in a traditional pre-19th century Japanese house, it's not a chair, because they don't sit on, it's not part of their culture. It's like, what is that? But it's not a chair because they don't sit. They sit on the floor, cross-legged. So it's our bodies. Is that door narrow or wide? It's just right for us. Someone who weighs 500 pounds, it's a little tight. Um, uh, it's, or you say in your car, I think I can get through. You have absorbed your car to yourself, and it's become part of you, as Nick McLuhan calls extension. Now, Merleau Ponty is probably one of the most brilliant 20th century philosophers, definitely worth reading. Uh, his material is very rude to Germans before World War II were very rich in Gestalt psychology, in studying the Gestalt as wholeness, the wholeness of how we perceive, how all this ties together. And he draws very much on that material. A couple more steps and we'll take a break. Um, next we get Anton Ehrenzweig. Now, everybody I've mentioned so far would be well known to most of your other faculty members, not Aaron Zweig. Um, he's extremely important and not well known. But he wrote uh, two major books. Uh, the first one was The Psychoanalysis of Artistic Vision and Hearing, and then uh, follow up on that, The Hidden Order of Art. And what he observes is, remember in our, some past lectures, we looked at Renaissance painting of a human being and say a cubist, Picasso cubist painting. And I said that, I stood over here, got all these wires, and I said, look at me. And then I observed that you have to move your eyes, somebody said, eight times to see all of it. So what you're seeing is very fragmentary. And while you're looking, I'm moving. What you then see, Aaron Swipe shows, is a and after image, your mind takes that low resolution, jumbled, fragmentary material and puts it together. If it's 1500 to look like Michelangelo's David, if it's 1910 to look like a Picasso Cubist painting. Now, I'm going to hypothecate that when Picasso paints like that, that's what he sees. No, no, no. He sees like a Renaissance artist, but he then puts it together in an abstract way. And we call it abstract art. I'm going to deny that. I'm going to say artists paint what they see. And when you flip through an art history book, every century is different. Why is that? Because they see differently. Why do they see differently? Because their perception works differently because they are, their extensions are different because they're in different technological worlds. They're a world of print or a world of electronics or a world of social media or a world of oral 
society. We're talking about a preliterate society. So McLuhan says, and we'll wrap up here and take a break. <clears throat> Marx said that a culture, different cultures are organized differently due to the primary material means of production. Are they hunter-gatherers? Are they agricultural? Are they industrial? Are they an information society? McLuhan says media are the primary material means of production. And he says all technology is ultimately media. So he's talking about media, but he includes, yes, books, newspapers, radio, television, but also automobiles, locomotives, trains, uh, etc. The body subject is my subjectivity makes this tape, well, or this chair a chair. But it isn't just my eyes that make it a chair, it's my whole body that makes it a chair. So the body subject is changed by the dominant media due to extensions. This just extended my nervous system to California. This hammer extended my arm. This clothes keeps me warm. A medium affects not only our exterior environment, there's automobiles out there. How many people have a credit card in their pocket? How many people came have a car, came here by car? Anybody want to go to California? Got a credit card and a car, we can leave now. So, you know, it's like, what does that mean? That, you know, 100 years ago, you maybe would plan for a year how to do that. Now, do you need a, you don't need a map. <laughs> and I got some gas in the car, but uh, I got a credit card. And there's a highway system out there. They, they already took care of that. So you don't have to make it through the Cumberland Pass with our, with our wagon train. Uh, what does that mean that I can, that we can walk out the door and go to the drugstore and say, ah, what the hell, let's go to California. <laughs> it's a drugstore California. That has made us relate totally differently to our, but the automobile has done that to us, made us totally different in our relationship to our environment. A medium affects not only our exterior environment, there are cars and roads out there, but I think totally differently about how far away is California? Eh, two years in a wagon train, six days in a car. Unless you want to relay drive, you can do it in three days. Uh, one person sleeps in the back, the other takes over the driving, you can do it in three days. Unless you want to go by airplane, we'll be there in uh, three hours because we pick up three hours <laughs> by the change in time. A faculty exercise developed, develops a faculty not exercise atrophies. So, any questions so far about McLuhan? Okay, let's take a 15 minute break, be back at 6.30. hasn't figured it out, there's a restroom to the left and there's a snack bar, a turn right where you came in. And there are vending machines uh, to the left of the snack bar.
That's an example of thinking about the world that our technology has given us and then the opportunities our technology gives us um, that address, if not solve, those problems. Okay, picking up on McLuhan, and again, he's talking about the world of the 1960s and 70s, but um, we should think about how do we apply this to the world we're in today? So McLuhan was born in 1911, died in 1980, but he was disabled uh, sometime before he died by strokes. He was a professor of English literature at, um, in Canada. And his key books were Mechanical Bride, Guttenberg Galaxy, and Understanding Media. And we listened to a little bit of him, and I suggest that if you want to follow up on today's lecture, you can um, uh, just put Marsha McLuhan in YouTube. A whole bunch of stuff comes up. So here's the New Yorker cartoon of the day. And uh, so here's the literate father. We're in his in his library, surrounded by books. Here's his folk singer, McLuhan fan son, his guitar. See, Dad, Professor McLuhan says that the environment which man creates becomes his medium in which his role is defined. The invention of printing created linear logical thinking. Today, with the television and folk singing, thinking changes again and there's a greater social involvement. We live again in a village. Understand? <laughs> His father is like, what? Another one of McLuhan's, uh, one of his many slogans, terms, is we are today living in a global village. In other words, the electronic media create situations like primitive, pre-literate villages, except the village is global. So, print media led to a human-centered worldview. Remember, perspective requires a person with a point of view, an individual person with a point of view. We don't necessarily have individual persons before the Renaissance. Perspective painting, artists had realized instantaneous juxtaposition 200 years before science. I won't go into what that is. If anybody is a kind of physics buff, you can ask me what instantaneous juxtaposition is. Uh, a clockwork universe that <laughs> Newton was able to show that if you know where all the planets are at a given moment, someone says, where are they going to be in five years? It's going to, you know, it's going to unwind like a clock by the laws of uh, gravity. This leads to the Industrial Revolution and modern science. Electronic media lead to nature as opposed to human-centered worldview, ecology, multiculturalism, our post-industrial electronic information world, holistic thinking, magical thinking, visual auditory culture, image over text. So if you look at magazines today, if there are any left, <laughs> there's probably, um, I don't know, two, three, four times as much image versus text as there was 50 years ago. Look at Vogue magazine in the 60s. They had long, serious articles. Uh, we don't see that anymore. Music as the dominant culture. So print media. In reading typeset phonet phonetic set, in reading typeset phonetic text,
when we read, okay, we've got fixed focus, center of vision, and peripheral vision. Now, it might not work for everybody, but if you look at my nose, and don't move your eyes, keep your eyes on my nose, how many fingers do I have out? Three. You can't tell, because you can see them, your peripheral, it was two, your peripheral vision sees them, but your peripheral vision goes to a part of your brain that can't count. It's very effective. When you draw it, you use your peripheral vision. You don't look like that. You look like that. If you suddenly were, you know, like you start looking at a license plate, you quickly go back. And if some, if a kid's like stepping off the curb, you immediately see it and stop. But it's totally different kind of vision than fixed focus center of vision, which is about three spherical degrees, and what you use in reading. And that goes to a different part of the brain, a linear logical part of the brain that can count. So all this complicated stuff happens to us. And when you read, again, you think about the first word you see in a sentence doesn't mean a thing. And by the time you get to the sentence, end of the sentence, it still doesn't mean much until you've got the whole paragraph. And your mind has no trouble holding that and putting it together. And then we have a term, dys, dys, dyslexic. And it's not a good term because it, dyslexia is not one thing. But there are people who don't read well. Now, I'm a very slow reader, and I can't spell. And one of the reasons is I don't see the words. I grok the whole word. I don't sound it out. And so is how do you spell condition? Is it C-O-N, C-O-N-D-I-S-I-O-N or T-I-O-N? Shun. Shun can be T-I-O-N or S-I-O-N. Well, if you look at condition and you notice and remember, but I've never looked at it. I just block the word when I'm reading. I don't look at it. It doesn't go to that part of my brain. So there's certain words I know, but I, boy, is spell check a godsend for me. Um, so, And probably a lot of different people read differently than other people. So when we see um, perspective painting, sometimes we're told in history of art, perspective is how we see. Before perspective, they hadn't figured it out. In modern art, they see that way, but they choose to abstract. Okay, I'm denying that. They saw in perspective in Western Europe between 1400 and 1900. No serious artist has used perspective since. No artist used perspective before. Well, the Romans did a little bit. We don't know what the Greeks did. We lost all our painting. And uh, artists in other cultures don't use perspective. For example, they use axonometric in China. So in China, um, there's a famous scroll that some thousand mile canal. Anybody know what that is? A famous canal from way back. And you can unroll the scroll and see scenes all along the canal. But none of them are further away or closer. They're Isometric makes them all the same because everything belongs to the emperor. So everything is equidistant and part of that realm. Once you have individual human beings, they generate their own perspective based on where they stand. And it's different for each individual depending upon where you're standing. You're going to get your own vanishing point.
So McLuhan writes, when he's writing, if you ever read McLuhan, he's talking about that, black and white TV. And as he's becoming famous, now color TV started around the late 50s, but nobody had it until the late 60s. And the first color TVs had a lot of color, mainly purple. <laughs> Everything was purple. And you spent hours in the back with these little dials trying to get your picture to come out right. Um, but McLuhan says, first of all, he says, TV is not a miniature movie. It's a totally different medium. It's not the movie in a small screen at home. A movie is light reflected. TV is light through. It's a totally different medium, affecting you totally differently. And color TV is a totally different medium from black and white. And this is a whole other thing. Has anybody gone up close in an electronic store to a 4K? Well, next time you're in a mall or you're any, you know, at a Best Buy, get rid of, it's amazing. And they're now just starting to come out with 8K. But even 4K, I mean, I have, we have a 1080p, and um, it's not worth getting a 4K until Netflix is in 4K. But there's not enough stuff broadcast in 4K that it, you need it. But um, this is like whole other things. And the, 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 you know, you go to the electronic store and they'll have these scenes at the Grand Canyon or something like that in 4K. And it's just amazing. So... <clears throat> In the 1960s, they took the transistor and were able to miniaturize and put thousands of them on one chip. So those are staples, so chips about the size of a fingernail. And how many transistors are on a high-end Intel chip today? Over 5 billion. So you can't, here you can see them. <laughs> You can't see them anymore. They're thousands of times smaller than what we see in this picture. But this is the first uh, first chip, the first computer on a chip. And you said those are staples to give it Those are staples to give it scale. So this is a minute microprocessor that has more brain power than a small computer. This is before, now they're in your computer. So 1984... We got the Mac, and what was special about it was the graphical user interface. Um, before that, you had to type all the commands, now you can point and click. And they worked with Piaget, famous child psychologist, and said, what does a child do when it wants something? Oh, okay, let's make the mouse do that. <laughs> they, they, um, they worked very hard to emulate, to, to make it come naturally, <clears throat> to make it intuitive, meaning you already know how to use it. I get really annoyed with stuff that I can't use because I said, look, Apple figured out how to make it so you, you know how to use it. Why can't anybody else? And of course, Windows does because it's just a copy of Mac. But... Um, so just a little bit of history there's a guy named Doug Engelbert he invented the whole thing the graphical user interface the mouse, the laser printer and the local area network at Stanford Research SRI Stanford Research Institute. It was all taken over by Xerox at Xerox Park, Palo Alto Research Center, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. So Xerox knew they had to move beyond the Xerox machine. They set up a division. They made the whole thing. They made the Xerox Star. It had everything. It could do stuff that today still can't be done. And they gave somebody a tour. Who did they give the tour to? Steve Jobs. 
he stole the whole thing. <laughs> and he made the Lisa, which was a high-end Mac, and then a couple of years later, Mac. So that's the history of the... Didn't Steve Jobs steal the file idea? No, the no. Uh, well, yeah, they the, the whole package. But they actually contracted, they gave it to him. The, uh, high, the higher ops at Xerox said, you can have our technology if we get 5% of Apple, something like that. Um, and <clears throat> Xerox just, one of the things that we come to understand when we look at technology is that, and we'll, we do have a whole lecture on um, destructive, creative, creativity and destruction. So in business, there are two terms. One is creative destruction, and the other is disruptive technology. And creative destruction is when one industry surpasses another, makes another industry obsolete. Uh, disruptive technology is when you have a high power technology like this. I probably, I don't edit movies, so I'm probably going to use 20% of this computer's capability 10% of the time. I'll never use 90% of its capability. Film editors will. Film editors always want more because they go to do something and it takes 10 minutes to, to render and they want to do 60 frames per second in real time. <laughs> so um, there you can get a 12 core, four gigahertz speed Intel processor. And you can spend $10,000 for a graphics processor. And it's worth it for a film editor because, you know, if, one, if it's 10 times faster, you can have one person instead of 10 people. You're going to save a lot of money. But 90% of what 90% of people do with this, this will do. I mean, <laughs> I watch TV on here. I send an email. What can, I, what can I not do? It's kind of hard to write a book. You can, but it's kind of tedious. With the little, but you can buy a keyboard. Um, so, they sell less of these every year now. These are in trouble. because the, And now these are getting to be in trouble. Um, so we'll talk about that when we talk about creative destruction. And here we are spreading it over the community, it's otherwise known as the internet. So McLuhan points out McLuhan looks at the effects on the sense balance and consequent effects on the structures of individual consciousness and social and cultural structures of, besides print and television, a lot of other stuff, railroads, automobiles, photography, radio, the electric light bulb. He has a little chapter on the electric light bulb, how GE doesn't understand that it's information without content. What does that mean? Well, when you figure it out, you'll launch the next technology. That's my car. I sold it a couple of years ago. It's now the coolest car in Sweden. It has a powerful V8 engine, automatic transmission, automatic seats, um, power windows. Um, it's got this gizmo here. The text, an oncoming car and dims the headlights automatically. I don't see that on cars today. But this is totally different. So a Tesla is not just a computer on wheels. It's software on wheels. <laughs> I mean, Elon Musk is thinking about something totally different. Not, it's not just an electric version of that. So what happens when they when they up when they come out with a 
new stuff for a Tesla, what do you do? Do you own one? Nothing. He downloads, automatically downloads the upgrade. <laughs> We're here, you had to trade that in and get the new one. So, now, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so now we can ask, what will be the effects of our new digital media, computers, the internet, smartphones, self-driving cars, and what more will come? Um, you look at how many how many of these technologies, nobody even saw it coming two years in advance. I built an online system for our company, and we used bulletin board technology. The internet didn't exist. And I went to the major conferences, you know, AT&T, everybody was there in the industry conferences. And one year, nobody was talking about the internet. The next year, all they were talking about was the internet. In one year, the year before, nobody saw it coming. I mean, AT&T, nobody. Um, so what makes us think this is the final, a final format, you know? Um, in two years, we might be using something that we're not even thinking about today. So right now, um, I'm really, right before class, uh, listening to this book. Finish this one. I just downloaded this one. I haven't started it yet. This is a book by Jill Abramson. She was the editor-in-chief of the New York Times for about two years. And as the New York Times struggled with how we're going to survive, half the newspapers in the country are out of business. Um, and a lot of it is they've lost like half their readers who are online. But then they've lost most of the department store ads as they're gone, replaced by Amazon. And they've lost all of their classified ads as they've gone to... Craigslist and Monster.com. So uh, what she does in this book is she looks at four institutions, New York Times, Washington Post, BuzzFeed, and Vice. So BuzzFeed and Vice are two online, whatever you want to call them, news, entertainment, whatever. How many people are have... Watch BuzzFeed or Vice. Anybody into any of them? Just, okay. So I've been looking at a lot of them because I got a, <laughs> what's she talking about? And uh, <clears throat> there's a science fiction story that, and I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. Neil Stevenson, Diamond Age. And it's about a ch world change from feed to seed. So the New York Times is top down. A bunch of editors get together in a room and decide what you're going to be looking at on the newspaper or on your phone tomorrow morning. In Facebook, what you see depends upon what the rest of us post. So one is top-down feed coming from a centralized thing. And the other is self-growing created by all of us. Which is going to control the future? Now, there are pros and cons of both. Um, if you're I mean, I've been, I, I, I was getting the New York Times in homeroom in junior high, so I mean, I've been following it for many decades.
but I can get really annoyed that they're telling me what to think. And, you know, they don't just present the news and tell you what you're supposed to think about. I don't know what makes them think they, you know, so that's the annoying part. The other part is we have a lot of smart people with a lot of resources working really hard to get us important information. And um, what's the future going to look like in those terms? Now, this is um, George Gilder. George Gilder wrote a book called Microcosm, Story of the Chip about 30 years ago. Mind-blowing book. I, I listen to it again every once in a while. But the story of how that the chip came about uh, and what it means and what it's doing. And then he got into um, information used to be expensive to transmit. So I had a girlfriend who's now my wife, after my wife, my first wife died. I had a girlfriend in California, and it was about 10 years before she moved here. We were talking four to $800 a month in phone bills, each of us. Eight to $1,600 a month, that's what long distance costs. I'm not talking about Europe, just talking about California. So, well, why didn't you use Skype? Skype didn't exist uh, 20 years ago. And then unlimited came along. You know, so your, your landline or your cell phone gives you unlimited calls anywhere in the United States, Canada, or Mexico. Well, they didn't have that. But what made that possible was as the internet started to happen, everybody and their uncle laid fiber optic cable. And they said, the demand for this is going to be unlimited. And then in 2000 was the dot-com crash. The, too, many, too many internet companies were created. Half of them did not survive. Anybody ever heard of um, MySpace? <laughs> that was there before Facebook. Um, they're gone. Friendster was there before Facebook. They're gone. Facebook is now one of the biggest companies there is, but plenty of them aren't. <clears throat> so George Gilder then talked about that, what it meant that we're laying all this fiber optic cable. Now what's happened without even, you know, so Steve Jobs went to AT&T and he said, I'm going to introduce this. I'll give you exclusive. Now before that, the phone companies controlled what a phone could do. And then Motorola would make a phone, AT&T would tell them what the phone could and could not do. They controlled everything. Steve Jobs said, I'm gonna make the phone. I'm gonna decide what it can do. I'll give you an exclusive for two years if you'll agree to provide the service for my phone. What was the difficulty? This uses 10 times as much data as a regular physical, you know, a flip phone. There's pictures on it. <laughs> and now you're watching high def TV. Well, what happened was they, they can keep increasing the capacity of the existing fiber optic cables. They say, well, we put laser light through there. We can put laser light of different spectrums. And light can overlap without interfering with each other. But something about light, it doesn't, you can put as much light as you want through a fiber optic cable and it doesn't interfere. So Google, he did a book about that. Now he's talking about Google versus blockchain. So blockchain is the underlying technology of Bitcoin. And it's a way of keeping track of record keeping. And he says, 
blockchain is going to look Google's. Now, every time we get a big tech like, everybody was freaked out by IBM. IBM controls the world. IBM controls the world. We've got to break them up. The government has to break them up. IBM's about to go out of business. Microsoft controls the world. My, Bill Gates is evil. The government has to break them up. Fortunately, got their act together. They almost, they almost disappeared. Uh, Google and Facebook control the world. Google and Facebook controls the world. We have to break them up. In five years, they'll be gone. <laughs> just like Microsoft, just like IBM. You know, it's like, I don't know what's going to replace them, but he does. This is what this book is about. So, wrapping up, we've got these media over history. Print. Print on a tablet. The original black and white TV. This is such a cool TV. <laughs> uh, this is a totally whole other thing. How many people have been to a movie in the past month in the movie theater? One, two. I don't think I, I've been... Maybe six months ago. Every once in a while, my wife says, I want to see that right now on the big screen. Tell you a little secret. My wife's brother lives with us. He's a techie. <laughs> she says, yeah, I can download that. If somebody in Ukraine has it, I'll get it. <laughs> and the thing is, and what have the movies done? Has anybody been to a movie in the past year? What has the movies done to try to compete? They give you this huge bark of lounger leather seat that reclines and, you know, I mean, it's not this that little movie seat with somebody's head in front of you. There's nobody in front of you. I mean, they're down below. First of all, stadium seating, solve that. But now they give you this monster seat with, with, with the reclines, like your living room. Uh, to try to keep people in the theaters. But, and we only have a 42 inch screen, you know, if you get a 65, it's as good as the movie theater. It's nowhere near as big, but I mean, you're much closer. So, and it's super high resolution, beautiful color. Um, so, you know, and then we get tablets and phones. And then the key to it is, how, what is the human interaction with these technologies? What does this mean? What is this doing to us? And we're only getting started now with what does the cloud mean? What's the fact that all this stuff... And, and the other part of this is sensors. So there's going to be... You buy a quart of milk, there's going to be a sensor in there that reorders from Whole Foods when it detects that the level has gone down, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, well, has those, like, push buttons. oh, the, the little uh, Amazon things. Amazon so it's like you put it next to like wherever it is, like when you, when you see your two you just push it and then like it delivers. Right. Like, two days. And then the sensor will do that for you. And then like the Amazon markets that they're trying to make where it's like they just sense that you've taken it out and they charge your account on that please you don't have to deal with tellers oh yeah, yeah it's stores without um cashiers, yeah. without cashiers because as you put it in your basket it detects it yeah it's one of my favorite photos Okay, so any thoughts about McLuhan? So I, this is not a technology course. I don't want to imply that we all have to be techies, but we all, all you, you guys are all facile with um, Adobe Creative Suite, right? In design, Photoshop, it's just like word processing for you guys. It's just stuff you naturally do. So you're already immersed in this. But then to think about not how do you use InDesign to create a magazine that someone's going to buy in the store? How do you use InDesign 
in a, you know, that it, it's not just how you produce it. It's all the stuff you produce is new. It's for totally different people in a totally different world that um, if you're designing graphical layout, it's graphical layout for that, not for magazines. So they're disappearing. So what does that mean? And how is that going? How is your in touchness with that going to enrich your creativity in your field? Any other questions or thoughts? See you next week. Oh, I've got to remember to turn this off. Hi. I, I had a, like, a problem. Can I just bend it? No, 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 I think I have a stop. Okay. Anybody's giving me an assignment and you need a stapler. Thank you. Thank you.